Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our webinar today. My name is Brian, and for those of you who don't know about us, we are a government-owned organization in Singapore that invests in and helps build deep tech startups, talent, and communities. At SG Innovate, our work involves connecting the global deep tech ecosystem, working with entrepreneurial scientists to bring their innovative research from lab to market, as well as developing deep tech talent. Today's event, Mandai Innovation Seminar, Envisioning Sustainability with Innovations, is presented by SG Innovate, Mandai Wildlife Group, and Open Innovation Lab. Today, we'll be starting the session with two presentations before going on, going to our panel of amazing experts who will be sharing more about how business units can innovate and adopt new business processes and technology to solve meaningful challenges. I also like to encourage our audience here today to share their thoughts on this topic and engage with our speakers by using the Q&A box below. And with no further ado, I will now pass the time over to our MC for today, Kia, for the Mandai Wildlife team. Kia, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Kia from the Mandai Wildlife Group and welcome to the inaugural Mandai Innovation Seminar by Mandai Wildlife Group's Open Innovation Lab together with SG Innovate. So today's seminar, we will have three segments. So firstly, we are happy to have Ms. Delvinder Kaur, who, will be our, who is our animal care officer, who will be speaking to us about achieving sustainability and the circular economy through our living collections and invertebrates with food waste. And after which, we are pleased to invite Mr. Sebastian Kern, Director of FMB in Grand Hyatt Singapore, speaking to us about Grand Hyatt's food waste management, um, how they repurpose and reduce food waste, as well as the other innovation initiatives that Grand Hyatt will be launching in the near future. And lastly, we have a panel discussion on understanding how innovation and sustainability marry together and discuss about the motivations behind organizations who champion sustainability and innovation. So my colleague Aiwei will be moderating this panel and she will share more details about our panelists during that segment. So now I would like to invite Mr. Ryan Han, AVP of Transformation Office, Mandai Wildlife Group, to make an opening speech. Hey, hi. Good morning and welcome to our first Mandai Innovation Seminar. Uh, thank you to each one of you for being here with us today. And today marks our first Mandai Innovation Seminar. And we are proud to be able to host it today with all of you. A Mandai Innovation Seminar is brought to you by Mandai Transformation Office and SG Innovate. So together with SG Innovate, we wanted to take the opportunity to create greater awareness of Mandai's innovation efforts. We have a big day of sharing about our sustainability efforts, innovation and technologies that enhance guest experience and platforms. These innovations deliver exceptional experience for our guests and animals and provide incredible opportunities to innovate and collaborate that continue to change the world. Mandai Innovation Seminar provides inspirational and insights from Mandai, and we are thrilled to invite Dalvinda, our animal care officer, to share the team's innovation revolutions in Mandai Living Collections. Sebastian Kern, Director of FMB Grand Hyatt, will share the innovations that deliver an exceptional guest experience. And lastly, we have a panel discussion forum to share how technology and innovation can power sustainability. So let's get started and over to Kai. So, uh, for our Monday Innovation Seminar. Okay, thanks, Ryan. So um, without further ado, let me just welcome Ms. Davinder Kaur, Animal Care Officer, Mandai Wildlife Group, on her presentation, Innovation Revolutions, Sustainability of Invertebrates in Mandai's Living Collections. Davinder, please. Hi, everybody. A very good morning. Um, my name is Elvinda Kaur and I'm the Animal Care Officer right here in Mandai Wildlife Group. So today I'll be presenting on the sustainability of invertebrates in the Mandai Living Collection. Now just a brief background before we jump into this whole topic. What are invertebrates? Invertebrates are basically a group of animals with exoskeletons. Now and it's some examples of invertebrates will be insects, scorpions, spiders, um, even including crabs. In Mandai Wildlife Group, we have a living collection of invertebrates that's focuses largely on terrestrial invertebrates. Now, without further ado, I'm going to jump into the presentation. So for today's content, I'm going to share with you the challenges which were identified by our team, the tools that we put in place, the critical thinking process. And I'll be sharing more about sustainable invertebrate feeders, the feeder model, and where are we now. So for the challenges that were identified, so for invertebrates, invertebrates are basically a very large group of animals. They're largely diverse. 
and developing specialization can be a challenge. Now for invertebrates in general, there are more than a million species that yet to be discovered and we're constantly developing our collection. Next, we have a very small animal care team. Our care team consists of about four individuals, including me. And invertebrates in general have a short lifespan and therefore they have, we have a shorter reaction time to react to changes. So um, our lifespan of our animals consists of two weeks and it goes all the way up to five years. The average lifespan is approximately nine months. We have a very large collection and therefore it's difficult to monitor progress. So right now in our collection, we have 85 species consisting of over 80,000 specimens. But lastly, most importantly, how do we attain and measure sustainability? So what we did is we put a few tools in place and I'll be sharing more about the tools right now. Firstly, these tools are assessment tools and it was created largely by our department. First, we have the Feasible Duty Index, which is a novel assessment tool. And what we did was to pre-assess all of the invertebrate specimens that we had in collection. And this will, uh, gave us a feasibility score. So we had a matrix and it sort of deciphered the proportion of invertebrates that we had in collection. And it was ranked from easy, medium to difficult. Difficult being the, the least proportion in our collection. And moving on, we have the sustainability index. Now sustainability index is very important to monitor our collection and it consists of five different algorithms. I won't go into detail with them, but basically the algorithms gave us a better idea of our collection growth whether they were sustainable, whether we were producers or consumers, and what was were our community impact. With that, we had a supporting database, and this was essential to monitor our collection. And this consisted of several programs and they were put together for data collection. And we actually assess this collection on a monthly basis as well as annual basis. So the critical thinking process. So, what do we do in a zoo? How do we actually put together uh, our collection? I'm gonna basically give you a jump in into how we decide how what animals to keep in our individual collection. So first of all, we collate the proposed species. Next, we assess the species based on the conservation roles, the research roles, education, and outreach roles as well. And with that, we also run the assessments, the feasibility index as well as sustainability index. Once that's decided, we finalize the collection plan. We keep the animals in our collection. And while we are maintaining them in our collection, we continuously evaluate the sustainability index. Is the collection sustainable or not? If it's not, we identify the management gaps. And often these management gaps will consist of issues with different infrastructure, husbandry, environmental factors, breeding trials might be needed to be conducted. And then we will implement the recommendations. And then we'll move back to evaluate the sustainability index. Is the collection sustainable or not? If it is, yes, we document the best practices. And often with invertebrates, because of the high fecundity rate, it often results in high yield. Now this gives us another problem. We have too many invertebrates. So what do we do with them? This is when we decided to reassess the roles of the invertebrates in our collection. And the current species roles, like I mentioned before, is conservation, research, education, and outreach. And then we decided to include another role, which is feeders. And that brings us to sustainable invertebrate feeders. So taking into account the high fecundity rate of invertebrates and the nutritional value to the diets of our vertebrate collection, the collection role of feeders was established. So in general, invertebrates are an important diet source for our animals. And we have decided to also focus on breeding a certain amount of invertebrates in our collection and to also ensure the, the best nutritional value for our living collection. So starting with our black soldier flies, they consume institutional food waste and we have established processes with high output. We also breed isopods. We've established the breeding of nine species of isopods. And with this, we also established bioactive amphibian tanks. So isopods are very interesting. Um, in a bioactive tank, what they do is that they run nutrients, they help plants grow better. And also at the same time, they are a supplemental food source for amphibians, the frogs. Then we have the Madagascan hissing cockroaches. This, also, this species also consume institutional food waste. We surplus approximately 14 kg monthly as feed. And for this financial year, what we're working on is feeding trials, utilizing pre-consumer food waste in our main kitchen, which is the restaurant over here in Singapore Zoo. And then the Malaysian blue worms, they consume institutional food waste. And we have established 15 wormy composting containers in the Mandai precinct. So all leftover food is processed into these containers. 
Lastly, we have produced phasmids. Phasmids are basically stick insects and leaf insects, and we have given out approximately 180,000 specimens to our living collection in the last financial year. We have also developed long-term management plans for 12 species, and this basically tells us what is going to happen with the species for the next five years in our living collection, how many numbers do we want to achieve, and how many numbers will go out as feeders. So this is actually the feeder model over here. This is two examples, a black soldier fly as well as a Madagascan hissing cockroaches. So you can now see over there in the videos that are playing, uh, we give them institutional food waste and they are fast consumer of the food waste. So as they are processing the food waste, one of the byproducts that we are attaining is the feeders, which is given back to our living collection. For the black soldier flies, we give them out at pupil stage. Uh, this is highly liked by our avian species, the birds. Well, the hissing cockroaches, they can be given out at the nymph or adult stage. So the hazing cockroaches are quite a good model as they can be given out in various sizes to the living collection and they have a lifespan of approximately five years. So where are we right now? So this is quite a bit of numbers, but I want you to focus on the colors. So red means not ideal, yellow means we are growing, green in general means stable, but there's no green in the diagram over here because for an invertebrate collection that's continuously moving and growing and the short lifespan is important for it to be yellow and not green. So as you can see in the last two years, 2020 and 2021, our collection grew tremendously, 5.51 times in 2020. And in 2021, once we have stabilized 1.47 times, which is quite ideal. And then we have more hatches than deaths and missing numbers. And at the same time, we have more dispositions and acquisition. This is one of the indicators of sustainability, meaning that we are fully sustainable. And lastly, we are producers. So that number over there, 163,880, that's the number of specimens that was pushed out to the living collection or sent out to other institutions. So moving forward, we aim to develop stronger circularity with invertebrates. We aim to expand current operations to process daily accumulated institutional waste. And that consists of pre-consumer food waste that's accumulated in our FMB outlets. And this is pretty important, especially with Mandai Wildlife Group expanding with the new parks. We will have more outlets as well. Animal food waste is another thing that we would like to process and animal waste as well. So we have run trials on animal waste. So we aim to incorporate technology to streamline processes and decrease workman hours. As you have shown you, we have developed the skill sets and using the skill sets, we will now like to tap onto technology to further make our processes more efficient. So moving forward, we also aim to develop educational programs and that consists of the invertebrate backstage pass, school tours, as well as sustainability showcase. Now these are programs that we've already trialed and run for organizations as well as schools. And this is something that we will tap on on a larger scale in the future. Well, with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. And if you do wish to learn more about the sustainability effort with invertebrates, do feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Davinda, for highlighting to us uh, of Mana Wildlife Group's innovation revolutions. So personally, I think it's really interesting to see how fast the food is consumed by the Black Soldier Fies um, pupils in the, in the video. And now I would like to invite Mr. Sebastian Kern for his presentation in the eyes of tourism, uh, tourism and hospitality environment beyond the horizons of pre and post renovation in this world of innovations and sustainability. Mr. Sebastian, please. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part, um, having me here today at the presentation lineup. Um, let me just see if I'm able to uh, control these slides. One quick second. Um, no. My apologies for that. No. Okay, maybe someone can help me to go to the next slide, please. Fantastic, thank you so much. So once again, thank you for having me, Sebastian, Director of the at Grand Heights, Singapore. Um, I'll be speaking a bit about our food waste digester and our main focuses based on reducing food waste within the hotel operations. And um, there are numerous of other sustainability initiatives we have launched throughout the last 14 years. Um, and we will mainly focus about food waste generation and how to reduce this as well moving forward. Um, at Grand Hyde, obviously, we, we heavily push ourselves to challenge the status quo. 
um, and really, really are committed in protecting the planet for future generations um, and have that holistic approach moving forward as well. So we have been pioneering quite a lot of initiatives on multiple touch points. Um, and one of the large one we have initiated was back in 2011, 2012, when we have implemented our in-house inbuilt food digester. Um, um, and uh, from there as well, trying to, to reduce any kind of waste going out of the hotel as well. So um, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, food waste is, and again, the following slide, one more, my apologies. Um, food waste, obviously, as we all know, might be one of the biggest waste streams within Singapore. Now, looking back at 2019, that kind of grew tremendously pre-COVID um, for, for up to 20% over the last 10 years. So going back um, to that particular moment, 740 million kilograms of waste was accumulated, and that's equal to two bowls of rice per person per day. So if you put that into perspective, that's around 51,000 double-decker buses of waste we kind of just throw down the bin. So we wanted to be very proactively supporting this and then trying to see modules of ways of how to reduce this as well. So not only do we have the food digester, we also incorporated three different other initiatives to look at the very starting point before procurement comes into place to the processing of cooking, preparing, initiating plating, as well as receiving back the food from the plates from the guest after consuming. So it was very important for us to review this whole holistic environment to understand what happens. So I'll be speaking about four main um, technologies and innovations we have implemented. The first one would be light blue technology, which is a pure food waste monitoring system. The second one would be our food donations. The third, the collaboration with Treacher. And the fourth, obviously, the digester itself. If I may ask for the next slide, please. Going on to the food waste monitoring system, it's, it's a company we collaborated with, with from, uh, originating from Bangkok, Thailand, called Light Blue Technologies. This particular firm comes in and evaluates your plate waste, your buffet waste, your preparation waste, as well as your spillage. So what does that mean in, in other terminology? So if we look in more direct terms of what the chefs prepare during their mise en place preparation, we will evaluate every single thing the chef would put into that bin based on preparation waste. So let's, let's assume it's a nice broccoli head. It has a wonderful stem. Usually the chefs would only kind of utilize and make use of that broccoli head because it's obviously the nicest part of that wonderful vegetable. But we could see in the bin, and we're taking a picture of it and measuring the weight, how many stems of broccoli we are kind of constantly throwing away from our Italian perspective, Italian restaurant. And we were thinking, chefs, what, what can we do? So why can't we use that broccoli stem? It's perfectly edible. Cut those into nice juliennes and put it into a nice minestrone. So suddenly we make use, a second use of certain ingredients as well. Buffet waste, one of the largest segments, we always realized, my God, we are throwing quite a bit of food away, um, uh, what is left over from our buffet. So we realized, for example, the national dish, our Hainese chicken rice, the chef every day cooked around 10 to 12 kilograms of rice. And we kind of threw away and looking at the bin and taking the image that we have been throwing away around two kilograms after each meal period. So the question arose, why can't the chef just cook two kilograms less? And you can tweak and menu engineer from there. Plate waste, very important for me. I would like to understand what comes back from the guest once they consume their meal. For example, someone orders a beautiful steak, has a side of mashed potatoes and a bit of asparagus. And we can realize by looking and evaluating what comes back that, wow, there's a lot of mashed potato not being eaten. So maybe the portion size is too big. So here again, we can menu engineer and really fine tune of what is going out to the customer and what comes actually back. And obviously last but not least would be spillage and spoilage. It's reforecasting and understanding your cover trends within the restaurants, knowing that if there's a large Sunday brunch and we buy in live Boston lobsters, is it worthwhile to reduce the order because we did not use them all up. So with those four main categories, we can really have a full holistic understanding of what's happening, what we purchase, what we use, how we go about those ingredients and what actually comes back and what do we waste from it. With that, obviously you can calculate an ROI based on cost per cover, which gives you a very good understanding of how your chefs actually deal with food. So that would be the parameter one. Once you understand that we already reduce substantially the amount of waste. So if you go to the next slide, please, 
you can have a quick overview of what we have saved within eight months. Um, that was in March 2021, um, purely based on one singular restaurant. In that case, was Mezzanine, our institutional Mezzanine restaurant. It's around a 200 seater restaurant. Um, and we saved around 11,000 kilograms of food around, I mean, we rescued with that around 22,000 meals and we kind of saved around 27,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So that's just one restaurant out of seven we have that's excluding event services as well. Um, but just want to give an insight of how much we are actually throwing down the bin if we don't look at it correctly. Um, going to the next slide, please. The second and third initiative out of the four would be our collaboration with Treacher. So again, this mainly focuses on buffet restaurants. We allow our guests to come in to half an hour before the hotel or before the buffet closes to grab a meal box. You can see that in the white color on the left-hand side and grab whatever he or she might feel like to, to, to bring home or eat on the go um, before we actually throw away whatever is left over down the bin here again. So again, we're trying to find intermediaries to reduce our food waste. Food donation obviously is a very logic one. Food, which is absolutely fine to be eaten and consumed like morning bakeries from our, from our breakfast will be given on to, to the less wealthy. So if we go to the next slide, last but not least, the last and the pillar would be our in-house built waste management system. First in the region that time, um, having a collaboration between a Singapore-based company called Biomax as well as Miko from Germany. Um, all our food goes into infeed station, is slingshot all the way to the basement, goes through a grinder, a dewatering system, and obviously a natural enzyme has been added on. And within 24 hours, we have 100% organic and pathogen-free fertilizer, which we then obviously reuse at our rooftop herb garden and random and in other random environments and landscaping environments as well. So not only do we bring nothing out to landfill, we actually also save around 55,000 trash bags, which is quite substantial and around $100,000 of, of waste haulage. So it's a win, win, win for all. So with those mechanisms in place, you really can understand that we have four major pillars in place to really limit and reduce and prevent food waste from the very, very beginning part once we actually purchase it. And I thought that would be quite interesting to share because I think food with a lot of Indies in Singapore as well is something one needs to really take under the realm and make sure that we are more proactive in reducing this heavily. Um, now moving on to the next slide, just a few quick sentences on what's happening post innovation. Some of you might know we are undergoing a full-fledged innovation. It's a 55-year-old hotel. It's time for a nice facelift. So I'm just showing two small little elements what we are planning to do post innovation and sharing it. There are many, many more, but due to time constraints, I will only be sharing two. If I may go to the next slide, please. Um, one of them is a biodiversity preservation project. Um, so we are really, or have been really studying with the project team, the flow of natural butterfly and wildlife habitats around the orchard area. It sounds magnificent, but it's, it's really true. So we have an angle of the hotel, which is pretty much L-shaped. We are controlled the wind flow and we need to understand how those habitats kind of are, are in that nature and that environment before moving on and, and constructing and re-renovating this hotel, especially the, the part at the back of our terrace swing tower, where we're in a lot of wilderness, jungle, and kind of an outdoor environment connected to obviously wellness and sustainability. So we planted different um, types of trees or will be planting those as well, making sure that we use um, obviously very natural um, ingredients like lemongrass patches around the pool to prevent mosquitoes, etc. So that was one of the main things we are looking at. And in the second slide following up, we will have also a rain um, water harvesting initiative that was not allowed a couple of years ago. Um, but now we do have that uh, possibility to utilize and, and utilize that water coming up from the sky um, and make a, a second life of it. So those will be utilized in our cooling towers for air conditionings and on and so forth. Obviously, also we're going to look at the laundry water. It's a massive in-house built laundry plant. We do not uh, bring our laundry from the hotel out um, of the hotel. So we're going to do this in-house. Um, and we look at the second, third, fourth, and first, obviously, recycle, wash from those plants. There are many, many more initiatives. Um, I'm more than happy to connect with the individual after, if, if time permits, share our sustainability deck in, in more depth, um, if interested. And, uh, and thank you so much once again for, for having me on this uh, discussion this morning. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I think it's really heartening to see like how mezzanine has saved so much in eight months. And also thank you for advocating for food waste management. Yeah, I think really exciting sustainability projects that is coming along from Grand Hyatt. And yeah, so thank you for that for your presentation. So now I'd like to pass on my time to my colleague Ai Wei, who will be moderating on the panel discussion on sustainability powered by technology and innovation. So how has new and emerging technology helped to improve our sustainability? I will, please. Thank you, Kia. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much for handing over to me, Kia. Uh, I have to say this morning's session being shared by Sebastian and Davinder has really made our environment here uh, feel like we are in a park already, although you know we are talking about innovation. So it is really how we view innovation in a different perspective. So today for the panel discussion, we have Ms. Rahaya Binti Saharom, our VP Sustainable Solutions from Mandai Wildlife Group, Fu Ping, Ms. Fu Ping Er, VP Group Sustainability Capital and Investment, and Mr. Gerald Ng, VP Environment and Sustainability Changi Airport Group. So the first question actually goes to uh, Ms. Rohaya from the Mandai team. Uh, as we have all uh, heard from the speakers about sustainability, conservation, and also regarding how we are protecting our biodiversity with innovation thinking. So uh, Ms. Rohaya, could you share with us some of the, uh, the initiatives that Mandai has taken towards achieving our sustainability goals? Hi, hi uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be uh, on this panel. Uh, and uh, right, uh, sustainability is uh, very much a part of Mandai. It's closely interlinked with uh, conservation and conservation is uh, what we do within Mandai. So as a responsible organization, uh, we, have, um, uh, we are committed to do our part in uh, mitigating the impacts of climate change. And just last September, we, pledged, uh, we made a public commitment to be carbon neutral by 2024. So we have ramped up efforts to reduce our energy and water use, uh, improving our energy efficiency. And uh, to move away from fossil fuel, we also uh, electrify our buggies and our trams. So if you were to come by our parks, you would be enjoying a clean and a smooth and quiet ride uh, on our trams. Uh, last year, we emitted about 16,000 tons uh, of uh, carbon, and we expect these emissions to continue to grow as we open the new parks in the next two to three years. But we cannot afford to, we cannot allow these emissions to continue to grow, right? So through, um, to keep a check on the emissions, we uh, had uh, incorporated many green and sustainable designs within uh, the new parks to reduce our carbon footprint. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we achieved the BCA green mark, uh, platinum for uh, some of the buildings within our parks. And uh, the Mandai Resort, for example, went one step further to garner, to garner super low energy award. So this greatly reduced the, um, our energy use by more than 40% by BAU levels. La. Right. So um, uh, other than that, uh, solar panels have also been installed at, uh, some of the new uh, at some features and we continue to install more of these in the new features. And uh, when we talk about uh, circularity, you have seen how uh, they've been mentioned just now. So we are also exploring uh, some ways to turn our uh, animal manure into um, useful energy or uh, fertilizer. So um, that's a, in, it is an ongoing process and we are constantly on the lookout for new technologies and innovative solutions, as well as our partners to join us in this journey. Thank you, Rohaya. Wow. I, I think when it comes to speaking about carbon emissions and being carbon neutral, I think this is one of the biggest buzzwords in, in this uh, past one to two years, you know, when we are, we are amidst the COVID situation. And, and now it brings me to direct another question to Gerald from Changi Airport Group. Being an airport operator, uh, Changi Airport Group must juggle between the aviation and the real estate uh, in the built environment industry. So what are the latest sustainable innovation trends that you see emerging in this industry? in this day and age. Thank you so much, Aiwei. And um, really just listening to the previous uh, talks by Delvinda and Sebastian, what strikes me is that for sustainability and innovation, you learn something new every day. And I personally felt that the previous uh, talks were really, really interesting and insightful. I think for Changi Airport, if you look at Changi Airport, we are many things at one time. So for people who are not traveling, uh, 
for the Singapore public. It's like a giant shopping center. It's a place that you go to over the weekends to have fun. Um, we are also a shopping center that happens to, just happens to have a lot of planes parked beside it as well. So there's also the air travel component. So when we're looking at sustainability, for us, we really approach it from um, the various factors. Of course, reducing energy consumption, water, waste, and climate resilience. But for to look at carbon emissions, it's essentially an energy transition issue. So how do we optimize our energy consumption on the ground? And of course, for air travel, how do we travel more sustainably? So I'll just touch on things that's happening on the ground first. Maybe I'll use Terminal 2 as an example. So we took the opportunity during COVID to really upgrade uh, the organs, the internals of the entire Terminal 2. So a uh, few examples, uh, our energy chilling systems, we have upgraded them to the basic class uh, efficiency models, and that has reaped a 30%, 30% efficiency upgrade over pre-COVID days. Uh, one thing interesting is also our design management team took a lot of efforts to see which materials within the terminal buildings we can upcycle. So next time when you, re when you visit the new Terminal 2 or upgraded Terminal 2, look at the wooden pillars along the departure halls and the transit areas. We have actually upcycled these materials. These are reused timber and panelling from the old terminals, but we have crafted them in interesting ways instead of using new materials. Even some of the benches, the chairs and tables, we have tried to incorporate some of these sustainability features into them and upcycle them. The other one which is very important is, so this is the hardware. The other thing that's very important is in terms of the software. I think the software, this is when we really upskill the airport community and we bring to them the importance of sustainability because no matter how good the hardware is, you do need a bunch of, a really group of dedicated people and in Changi Airport, there are over 30 to 50 companies, um, different companies working in the airport environment, how we can all work together. Uh, this, we talk about smart sensors, which is the IT sensors, but I feel that the smartest sensors are human beings. So the smarter sensors, we have a environment working group that crosses airport partners and this environment working group comes together on a monthly basis. We share ideas. We actually pinpoint areas within Changi Airport that maybe there's room for improvement in terms of sustainability. And then we try our best to implement these ideas in a very practical manner. Um, so this is things happening on the ground. On the air, just last month, we partnered Singapore Airlines and the Aviation Authority of Singapore for a trial of sustainable aviation fuel. So this is SAF, SEF um, acronym. It's not talking about our Singapore SEF, but sustainable aviation fuel. So SAF is produced almost entirely from animal waste. So tallow, which is uh, animal fat that is processed and uh, imported from countries such as Australia and New Zealand and surrounding regions. It's then refined in a refinery that's based in Singapore, converted to jet fuel. The beauty about this is that it's a droplet fuel, so it has a zero emissions footprint because it's entirely made of upcycled materials. It's actually blended with your jet fuel. So the next time you fly out from Changi Airport, in fact, at this very moment already, a certain percentage of your jet fuel is actually made from animal waste. So this is really, I think, a way in which the aviation sector is trying to decarbonize. But of course, going forward, we do know that air travel will continue to emit carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. It is a challenge, um, I think, for the industry to see how best we can continue to be more sustainable. So uh, partners such as Airbus and Boeing, uh, industry partners across the world, are really looking at what's going to be happening in the next one, two decades. So in terms of innovation, they are seeing, okay, is hydrogen a possible form of powering air travel in the future? So as an airport operator, of course, we are very concerned about infrastructure requirements, the safety needs as well, and how can we make a smooth transition to hydrogen or electric powered air travel in the future, in the next one, two decades, do it safely and in a way that is uh, cost efficient for all the parties involved. Wow. Um, and of Girl. course, since this is a Monday seminar, maybe just a very last point, which is uh, we, can't, we can't forget about biodiversity and wildlife and I think something that would uh, be interesting for the audience to, to understand is also that the plants in our terminal, we have started to use compost that is uh, created from a plant method that's from our old plants in our nursery. So it's composted and then our sunflowers and our flowers throughout the terminals are grown using compost. So it's, it's a virtuous life cycle. So thank you. Wow. Thank you, Gerald. I'm, I'm, I'm just really 
excited to hear all these things that you're sharing because as I'm looking at the screen and the cameras, right, uh, my colleague Rohaya was actually very excited when we are talking about animal feeds. We are talking about how you know Changi Airport has has really expanded their innovation and design thinking into how you are integrating the operational uh, um, perspective on and also how you are delivering all these things into how we operate our planes as well and our jet fuels. This is really something that I think uh, for everyone who are in this session here, um, very new uh, information that that we are getting off uh, you. So of course being um, in the real estate group itself. Now I'll direct the, the question to Pinga. Uh, I think she's, she's really fired up to, to share something with us. Um, so we understand that Capital Land has also recently commissioned a, a very unique building called Capital Spring. And could you just share with us the sustainability features that this building has um, and also some of the innovation uh, aspect? Thank you. Um, maybe just a big uh, introduction. So for those who are not familiar with Capital Land, investment. So we're a real estate company and our asset types cover a big range all the way from shopping malls, office buildings, data centers, warehouses. Did you know that? Business parks as well. So in Singapore, yes, our latest project is Capita Spring. I just want to highlight a few points and I just want to focus. I think we always have a lot of things to share. But first of all, buildings are built for people to live and work and play. And to us, is always being considerate about our surrounding. So when we share about this building being biophilic, very cheap term, right? But it's all about building in a lot of nature into the city space. The location of Capital Spring is right in downtown CBD. Secondly, we, did you know that we used to have a hawker center before we built, rebuilt this place? So what happens to the hawker center when we were building this place? What about all our communities around? Where would they go without the hawker center, right? Did you know that we built an interim hawker center in the Upper Cross Street for the years that we were constructing so that we would keep the hawkers still employed and not go all over the whole of Singapore downtown, you know? And then we lose the essence. So I welcome you back. The hawker center is at level two and three. Secondly, um, I'll just focus on another piece uh, of this building. When we built it, just like what Mandai has, just like what Changi Airport is talking about, biodiversity, do you know how much greenery there is in this building? We only have a vertical space, so we can only build our, build our greenery into the vertical space. We have more than 80,000 plants. We have more than 130 species. We make sure that more than 60% are native species. We are mindful that we are in a tropical space. So we make sure the species chosen can thrive very well. And secondly, it must thrive well in a high rise environment because guess where they are? Our green oasis is at level 17 to level 20. This is a 51 story building. It's right smack in the middle. It's a vertical lung for the downtown city. Do you know how many trees there are? We have 160 in this building. And we aim for it to grow, hopefully, up to about 10 meters. But it, it takes a lot of thinking. So I, I just want to highlight why. Why did we invest in this time and effort? Because even in the design process all the way, we thought about the impact. A lot of people just suddenly realized this urban heat impact recently, right? Because it was very hot. And then to those who love to travel to Europe, I used to be one of those. Can you imagine my favorite cities like the United Kingdom and Italy is now reporting 40 degrees in their summertime. We have never hit 40 yet. They just hit 40 for the first time in UK. What is the value of just such greenery is actually it brings down the urban heat effect. Let's not talk about, you know, this very keen term called carbon sequestration, right? Because it naturally absorbs CO2. So I just want to highlight uh, one point about this building is that innovation is not just about technology. It's about thinking as well. Did you ever think that we could have built such a green oasis in a building that is uh, 200 meters tall? And that's Capital Spring. And right at the top, we have decided... Um, we have made the call, okay, solar panels or something else. The something else is the third urban farm we have in our properties in Singapore. Our first urban farm is Raffle City. Second urban farm 
at Funan, which is open to the public. And this third urban farm is at Capital Spring right at the top. And we mindfully work with our local players. And there are actually five themes. Did you know there are five themes? Singapore Garden, a Mediterranean, a Japanese, an Australian, and a wellness. Why? Because it's a farm and it's going to produce products for the restaurants located right up there. And there is a Japanese restaurant there. So with that, I just want to stop because if I continue, it will be just an entire session just on Capital String. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you, Ping. I, I think it really gives us a, a broad understanding of how Capital Land has been uh, expanding the buildings here, how we are retaining jobs, which, you know, these are one of the UN uh, goals a, as well. Um, yeah, we, we, which is really great because most of the organizations here and um, the attendees who are listening in, I'm pretty sure, you know, we want to do good for the environment and at the same time, we want to contribute within our organization as well. So, okay, going back to uh, Rohaya, this question. So how, you know, since um, everyone has shared regarding innovation and sustainability, so how do you incorporate innovation with sustainability in Mandai or within uh, our sustainable solutions department? Yeah, uh, so my my view is that um, in terms of uh, innovation and sustainability, right, they come hand in hand. Uh, but I do really feel that uh, sustainability is the key driver uh, to innovation. So within Mandai, sustainability is uh, the, the thing that drives us towards innovating our processes, our operations, our services, our product lines, even our uh, thinking. So to reduce consumption of new materials, for example, we practice uh, reuse, uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, use uniforms within Mandai. Uh, use as hammocks for some of our collection animals. And uh, when uh, our beloved Inuka, the polar bear, passed on in 2018, we turned Inuka's exhibit into an animal playground that provides enrichment, activity, and exercises for our collection animals. And uh, this, uh, what we do with this playground is that uh, we don't use new materials. We take the old exhibits uh, and we recycle and turn in them into swings, into hammocks, into slides, and other types of uh, playground equipment. I think I remember uh, Jared mentioned something about cycling uh, some of the used items into furniture, right, in the airport, in the terminals. So we also really do this. And uh, I also feel that uh, in terms of innovation, uh, uh, partnership and collaboration is important. We partner with institutions of higher learnings and other research organizations. Um, we explore more efficient ways, for example, to irrigate plants. Uh, we give them water when they are thirsty. We don't just passively irrigate them according to timings. Eh? So this is uh, being explored through smart irrigation. And uh, drone is also used in planning for our ecological restoration work and to monitor growth of our canopy layers. And uh, when it comes to food waste, uh, the waste trimmings from food that was uh, previously thrown away are now saved for food for some of our animals. So uh, recently also there's this trend among some organizations to avoid using the word waste. So this is another kind of innovative thinking uh, that can give us, uh, that can give rise to exploring new ways to valorize ways. Thank you, Rohaya. Wow. I, I think that's, that's really yeah. He's still sharing. Hi, sorry. I think um, I was facing a bit of a Technical issues, just give her a moment, please. Thank you. Okay, okay, I'm back. So sorry about it. I think the internet connection was unstable. Okay, we, we just needed to loosen up a bit here. Okay, uh, thank you, Rohaya, for sharing. I, I think that is really something that everybody needed to, uh, to understand and to learn um, about the uh, initiatives that the zoo has been doing. And because, you know, Mandai Group has been embarking on so many special projects, which a lot of people, or even Singaporeans like ourselves, we, we actually do not, no. So, you know, it is time for, for us to, to also uh, do a short shout out to everybody that, you know, if you want to be part of our Mandai's ecosystem, work with us, right, you know, feel free to, to reach us at uh, the end of the session. That's fine. So moving on, um, back to Gerald again for Changi Airport Group. Um, what are CAG's sustainability priorities? 
And if you could um, name us, you know, one of the most uh, challenging sustainability priority. Sure. Thank you. I think I think I will categorize it to short term and long term. Short term meaning for the next ten years, say until twenty thirty five or so. The challenge is that we set ourselves quite an ambitious target, and it's a good challenge. Uh, we set ourselves a target to cap our absolute emissions. So it's called. It's a funny name. It's called zero absolute growth. But essentially, what it means is that we are committing not to uh, generate more carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, based on pre-COVID levels, based on 2018 levels, um, even though we are going to be serving more passengers, more passengers are expanding our infrastructure. So this is quite a significant challenge that we set. I think we're, when we're looking at, as we all know, in terms of air travel, we look at, um, they call it travel with a vengeance. So there's a lot more um, flights coming on and going nowadays in Changi Airport. And, and that's really great. And one thing I'm really glad to share is that I think by the end of this year, the, the amount of air travel that we have is going to go back to almost pre-COVID levels and it's going to go higher than that, um, hopefully in the next few years. At the same time, we're capping our emissions. But um, in terms of our carbon footprint, more than 99% of our carbon footprint is from electricity consumption. So the only way in which we can cap our emissions and in fact, lower our emissions is how do we power our terminals more efficiently and in a greener manner. Um, it's, we're not going to do it solely by through the purchase of carbon credits. I think we do need to look at on-site measures to bring in renewable energy, things like solar panels, uh, other renewable technologies. We are, owed, we are even going to go on a feasibility assessment in the next few months to look at whether it's feasible to actually even put solar panels on the airfield where the aircraft are maneuvering and uh, taking off the landing. It's, of course, there's some inherent uh, risks, so we need, do need to make sure that it's done in a very safe manner. Uh, we are also looking at our water bodies. Is there any way to conserve water, uh, decrease the energy that's used for water pumping for our water bodies? Uh, within our terminals, is there a way, because a lot of our terminals are clad in glass, and I think as many in the audience know, glass does create a bit of greenhouse effect. So is there any way we can do a little bit of retrofitting here and there within our terminals to reduce the energy, con energy consumption. We are also looking at maybe a bit of predictive technologies. So weather patterns, for instance, if there is going to be a cold front coming, there's going to be rain, um, maybe we can preemptively up the temperature of our air conditioning systems because uh, in anticipation of, say, cooler ambient temperatures within the next one, two or three hours. So these are things that we're doing in terms of Lighting as well um, and air conditioning as well can because we are looking at legacy infrastructure. Terminal one was built and started operations in the early 1980s, actually 1981 to be exact. So is there a way we can break down our cooling and lighting systems into smaller zones within the terminals so that we have a greater sense of control? And I think uh Pengo will, will share a different perspective because for new buildings such as Capital Spring, these Features are already incorporated. That's why the buildings are green. Whereas for us, we have a lot of legacy buildings, buildings that's built across different generations, literally. So our kids, uh, our grandparents' era, our parents' era. So is there any way we can actually bring all these buildings up to speed and make it more coherent in terms of um, smart monitoring technologies? A bit of these challenges. Beyond the short term, so beyond, say, mid-2030s or 2040s, a very real concern is climate resilience. Is there, not is there, but we have to, we have to make our assets and our operations more resilient to climate changes. And just like just now I was talking about hardware, this is where we make our assets more resilient. The software is very important as well. Ambient temperatures are going to get hotter. We have a lot of our colleagues working on the air side. They are exposed to the weather elements day in, day out. Um, are there ways in which we can protect their health and safety and at the same time, ensure that operations can go on as well. Um, maybe I'll just leave with a very interesting point. We are even coming up with really wild and crazy ideas. Um, for instance, you know that Singapore, in terms of lightning strikes, we are a country with almost the greatest uh, intensity of lightning strikes anywhere in the world. We are even experimenting with what we call kamikaze drones. So whenever the aircraft are parked at the terminals, 
we might deploy these drones when the weather conditions are very bad so that these drones are kamikaze. Uh, when lightning strikes, instead of striking the aircraft, it will strike the drone. And then um, once these drones are strike, then a parachute will be deployed and these drones will hopefully gracefully float to ground. We will repair them and we will get them back into service again. So these are ways in which we are protecting really our asset workers. And it's very, very important because operations cannot go, no matter how much automation and robotics you put in, you do need a human element in terms of aircraft operations. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Gerald. Wow, okay, speaking about the lightning, you know, in Mandai, we are really at the heart of, of the Singapore uh, area where we get a lot of rain and we get a lot of lightning strikes as well. You know, these are something that we, we ourselves, we, we face as a problem and, you know, we are constantly trying to find solutions to it. So, um, moving back the question to Pinga and, and what Gerald has mentioned, you know, Pinga will have more to share regarding uh, this very special uh, aspect in terms of how we are solving problem statements. So just last month, Capital Land uh, completed the Sustainability X Challenge 2022. And uh, we would like to know more about how uh, and what the public can expect from the winners of this challenge. Because in Mandai, we are also doing something similar while we are also looking out for partners to solve our problems with us. Thank you. So I will I will give some background if it's okay to why we went on this journey. And this is not the only platform where we source for innovation. So we, um, just to give you an idea, Capital Land Sustainability X Challenge is the first for Singapore real estate company to globally source solutions. And secondly, that's for globally source inward, but internally we also have established a Capital Land Innovation Fund. And that's where we will have uh, two calls, two to three calls a year. So all the companies, all the business units, they are constantly looking out for solutions. And if they fit the criteria, it go through an evaluation and it will be co-funded or fully funded. That's how uh, innovation culture is being driven in Capital Land. So back to this, uh, in Capital Land Sustainability X Challenge, we have four challenge statements um, relating to low carbon, circularity, water resilience, uh, as well as healthy and safe buildings. But I just want to focus on the first point. What is the ultimate challenge? Our biggest challenge, I think, is the low carbon transition. Capital Land has a science-based target that is aligned to the 1.5 degree scenario, and it has been approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And Capital Land is not just a Singapore company. Just to give you an example, we have one Raffle City in Singapore. Guess how many in China? Almost 10, you know? And one of them is almost 10 times the size of our one Raffle City in Singapore. So when we share that we have a global challenge, it's to solve our global portfolio issues. So back to low carbon transition. Um, I want to tag on Gerald's point. Um, yes, Capital Spring is a brand new build, but do you know how many of existing buildings you have? And can you guess how old they are actually? So Raffle City, if I didn't tell you, do you think it's a 38 year old building? Plaza Singapura is at the end of Orchard Road and it's right next to Istana. It is actually 48 years old, almost 50 years old and uh, consider one of our earlier malls. So they are also our precious assets. And I think our biggest challenge is, how do you retrofit an existing building to a new standard? Because the biggest thing is if you were to demolish it, there is embodied carbon when you rebuilt it. So every decision we make, we are very thoughtful, and that is a challenge in itself. Every roof space, it can be a solar panel. We have solar panels on top of quite a lot of our assets, but the challenge is uh, we have to balance it against uh, other sustainable needs and uh, items as well. So I think I just want to highlight uh, the way we have gone about it is, one, it is a collaborative effort. Um, two is being very clear um, how we are going to run this process. We have more than 60 partners who work with us on uh, CSXC in short. When we have a global call, it is filtered through. We have this year alone more than 300 applications from close to 35, uh, more than 50 cities, uh, countries actually. And then there is an evaluation process. We don't think we are the only best people who can decide whether it fits us. We work with government agencies, external parties, and that's why I think uh, we, we know SG Innovate very well, right? Secondly, the people who are going to deploy these technology are very important. So the operational teams, the people are going to sit in as they evaluate. 
So I'm very happy to share that, yes, we have 10 finalists who pitched uh, and we are going to pilot them. But, you know, it just happened last month, so I don't have anything to share. But what I want to share is what we did for our first run. In our first run, which was last year, we piloted six despite COVID. And I hate to say it, COVID really put a dampener because, you know, it's so difficult to do a lot of things. We piloted six. And I just want to encourage people. The first pilot that completed is on a super low energy building in Singapore. It is already super low energy. Remark. When we piloted it, it doesn't look very sexy, you know. It looks like, oh, it's a ceramic net. But my colleague said it, it, it looks fantastic. You just insert a net. But the efficiency of our fan and our AHU went up by 10 to 50%. So the encouragement is even when it's a platinum or super low, you can try. The people who will help you fine-tune it are the people you need to pull in as partners. We have also deployed at our existing building, Six Battery Road Innovations, Raffle City, as well as our second latest or third latest building called Capita Green, also a very... Uh, highly rated, green rated building. So we're looking forward to the outcomes and I strongly encourage uh, companies who, who want to be a startup. Three things I do want to share is you can have an idea and it's a fantastic idea, but to really succeed, you need to think about production because once you try in one place, then what's next? True success is if you can scale it, right? Secondly, you need to learn how to pitch. I'm sorry, you'll need to pitch to the asset owner and you're going to pitch to the people who open the treasure trove. So I think one of the things that CSXE has done is we found partners who were mentoring the 10 finalists because that is the that's another prize. Being a finalist of CSXE is you'll be mentored because you'll be mentored by venture capitalists how to pitch so that we hope that even if you try with us and your next innovation, you will succeed as well. So I just stopped there before I you know I take up too much time. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pinga. I, I think that's that's really insightful. Okay, I just have a short uh, one to two minutes uh, last question for uh, Rohaya. So sustainability not only encompasses being energy efficient as shared by um, the other two panelists as well. So it includes care for environment such as our flora and fauna. So what are some of the things that we are doing differently in our sustainability efforts? Maybe you can just share with us to... Uh, use this also as a closing for the panel discussion. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks Awe, for, uh, for this question. Uh, biodiversity protection is uh, the second pillar of our environmental sustainability strategy. The first pillar is resource, uh, um, resource optimization, and the third pillar is our uh, sustainability advocacy. So um, to talk a bit about the development uh, of uh, Mandai, Mandai, um, uh, within Mandai Precinct, uh, when uh, it is developed uh, upholding the principles of environmental and wildlife protection. So uh, in 2015, a comprehensive EIA was uh, conducted, uh, which provides the ground rules for development to be conducted in a responsible manner. And an EMMP, which we call the Environmental Management and Monitoring Program, uh, was in place. And this is observed uh, very closely. So we have, uh, I have a team of environmental uh, man management uh, officers who go down and uh, make sure that uh, these rules are adhered to. And uh, the Mandai Wildlife Bridge was the first to be built uh, to provide a safe passage for uh, wildlife to cross the road that has been separated for more than 60 years. So I think, you know, uh, Pengha mentioned about the, the age of building. So Mandai is uh, coming, will be about 50 years, the zoo. So uh, next year we'll probably be celebrating our 50 years anniversary. So, um, and, uh, uh, and also we have these 60 hectares of development area and we reserve 20% of them uh, as buffers to cushion the wildlife uh, from the impact of the development, All right? So, and we try to preserve as many trees as possible. So we have three protection zones, uh, and um, they form. They also form part of the landscape of the new features. Yeah. So uh, other than that, we have wildlife awareness training, and these are given to the contractors on site. So in case they come across any wildlife within the construction site, they know what to do, um, manage them properly, don't mishandle them, 
and don't hurt them. So we have these wildlife management officers uh, on standby, 24 hours. Yeah. So uh, and lastly, we have this. Uh, uh, we have established this Mandai Nature, which is a non-profit uh, organization, and uh, it does uh, conservation work within Singapore as well as within the Southeast Asian region. Yeah. So that's just biodiversity within Mandai. And then, okay. Lastly, we also have uh, what we call the uh, Mandai Ecological Restoration Program, where we seek to restore some of the degraded forest lands, but not only restore, we also seek to enhance them further. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, I think I was facing some technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rohaya, for the interesting sharing. I think uh, we've come to the end of the panel discussion. Thank you very much for all your time. Um, I will hand over to Ryan to do a quick closing. Yeah, hi. So uh, thank you, uh, Kia, and to all our presenters. Uh, what an exciting day of sharing. We shared about how we achieve sustainability through our living collections uh, with the food waste. Uh, we talked about the pre and post renovation in this world of innovation and sustainability. And lastly, during the panel discussion, uh, we shared the knowledge how emerging technology helped to achieve our sustainability goals. I hope this seminar has helped and enabled all of uh, y'all to do even more amazing things. Uh, we hope you enjoy today's seminar and do watch out for our yearly Mandai Innovation Forum coming this October. Uh, next, I'll pass over to Brian from SG Innovate to do the closing. Thank you for that, Ryan. Thank you all as well to all our speakers today for the insightful and knowledgeable discussion, as well as our presenters for the insightful presentations. I think I can speak on SG Innovate's behalf to say that it was a pleasure to have a group of experts like yourselves here today to share your insights on such an important topic. Special thanks to the team from the Mandai Wildlife Group as well for your help with putting the, the event together. Um, for our audience today, do also take note that we'll be sending out a post-event email with all the important information you may need, including a recording for this webinar. So do keep an eye out for that. So, and with that, we've come to the end of our webinar today. Thank you all for spending your Friday morning with us. And on behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to wish you all a great week ahead and we look forward to seeing you again at the next one. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much, everyone. See Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Sebastian.